Um, can you see the screen? Yep, we can see it. Awesome. Um, okay, so yeah, thanks Bryce for the intro. Um, I'm Will Pierce, I work at Soundbreak Security. Um, and as I was you know, building the talk, obviously you have to submit. And then when you're building the slides, um, you know, it gets, you maybe take it in a different direction. So this, um, you know, we're gonna talk about phishing and sort of the applications of um, AI um, to phishing and kind of where that's at and the, the work that we're doing. Um, but so some previous work, um, we've done some talks in um, at Besides Las Vegas as well, which is Besides has been one of my favorite venues to give talks at. Um, sorry, as a chat. Um, and we gave a talk at DerbyCon about kind of similar things. Uh, we have um, some public projects already out there. So OpBot, um, which uses reinforcement learning to sort of find administrative privileges. Um, proof pudding um, was sort of our adversarial attack against Proofpoint. Um, we get to drive by them on 15 every day. And so this was, they're kind of on our, our hit list. Um, command recommendations with RNNs um, and Deep Drop, which I just rewrote. Um, so Deep Drop is just a sandbox classification model. Um, and I just rewrote it to give back a score. So it used to do the whole dropper thing, um, but I tore out the, all of the dropper bit and now it's just an API. Um, we were scheduled to give some talks, but thanks to Corona, um, are here, so we'll have to save them for our, our course in Black Hat. But um, so the first question when you're looking at machine learning says, is machine learning right for you? Um, and you know, really machine learning is there is a lot of hype around it, and that's you know with good reason. It it can be really effective. Um, but ultimately, you know, you're just trying to model a uh, a problem mathematically, um, you know, there's not much magic to it. Um, you can use it to predict without explicit programming, um, but you yourself are still going to need to know how to program. So you can't just throw data in and expect something useful out. There's going to be um, a very heavy workload up front in terms of collecting data, um, parsing data, and making it, um, transforming it into a format that's going to be useful. Um, that's even that's before you even get to the the piece like you know feature feature engineering where you're you're using your knowledge to um, lead the model in a particular way. But ultimately, you know, it allows us to be more productive. Um, you know, we can do things like automate decisions. You know, we, we just we want to offload that um, more manual work to to an algorithm. So if there are simple things. Um, that you can automate, you know, decisions that you can automate, um, you know, like deep drop, for example. Uh, that's, you know, you can be more productive and you can focus on different things. Um, the industry is growing super fast. Um, computing power, um, you know, there's some stat that goes around once every once in a while. It's like computing power doubles every, you know, 50 days or something. Um, and so, you know, it, there's a lot, there's a lot out there and there's a lot to be done. Um, we kind of think that you know, some basic knowledge of machine learning will be required going into the future. Uh, it's still magic. Every time, you know, it, it, every time I go through and I explain a neural network to, to one of my colleagues, um, it's still a little bit magic, but it is, it is mostly math. In fact, I, it's only math, um, which is, you know, I wouldn't be afraid of the math piece. The math, you know, the math's kind of already done for us. Um, you know, I like to say algorithms are empty. And so the math, we don't have to, to struggle with the math. Um, it's done for us. On the right, uh, this is a little excerpt from talk to Transformer. So I just actually, there's a talk to transformer.com and it's just uh, the GPT-2 model, which is a big language model hooked up. And I simply just asked it, is machine learning right for you? <laughs> and uh, this, this is what it came up with. So in some ways it can, it can be coherent and in other ways it, um, you know, it can kind of talk around the subject. Um, offensive machine learning. So this is kind of, I've kind of stopped, no, I have stopped doing ops at Silent Break um, for now. And I focus mainly on, you know, building tools and research that help support our ops team. 
Um, and offensive machine learning is just simply the application of machine learning to offensive security problems. So whatever that may be, whether it's you know generating phishing emails, whether it's you know finding administrative access faster, um, whatever that may be, um, we're just using that as a blanket term to, to kind of separate. But it helps us reduce cost. So you know we hunting for admin access or hunting for information in, in really large networks is very costly um, and can you know take quite a long time especially you know if you if you're going through potentially a thousand file shares it'd be really nice to have some sort of intelligent um, system by which you could go through uh, automate decisions you know just offload those simple decisions we can scale operations on the defensive side machine learnings you know not being looked at as a replacement um, for human interaction um, but you know in order to scale or at least that'll be the first step is to scale uh, we can dig through our data and we can create advantages so red teams i think traditionally haven't collected or even cared about what data they're looking at or collecting um, but you know digging through the data we can create our own advantages especially as networks get um, tighter and you know more products sort of land on the endpoint uh, and you know, there's obviously the adversarial piece, um, and we we count the adversarial machine learning under um, offensive machine learning as it just helps us further our you know, more nefarious goals. So, you know, well, if we can bypass proof points model with an adversarial model, then you know, that, to us that helps us further our our offensive um, objectives. And you know, machine learning is awesome. Um, Digging into it, if you're if you're into data, or if, you know, even if you have you know that little that little spark or that that love for you know just numbers or or, or data, even if you're not into math, um, you know it's I like to say it's not a math problem anymore. The math's done for us. It's it's an engineering problem now. Um, and so you know most of my work is actually you know a lot of some people make the um, the analogy that data is oil and if this were the analogy were true then i'm building the drill so we have a lot of data here uh that we you know can't keep on to so i have to you know build some sort of drill that we can transform it before it, it gets deleted uh, and the math taken care of so it's not it's not a math problem so if you're interested in it i you know i'd highly recommend you know digging into it because it's not as, as complicated as you, you would think but we're, you know, we're able to model complex relationships. So, you know, if, if we're looking through Active Directory, you know, I, I can find, you know, a little nugget of information way faster with some sort of similarity algorithm than I could um, scrolling up and down in a text file looking through information. Obviously, with the computing, you can just crush huge amounts of data. Uh, there's no, there's almost no limit to it. And the data we have, we're not saving, you know, billions of data points we have you know maybe 300,000 so it's not it's not a, a ton um, you can make it as complex or as simple as you want so anything from binary classification to uh, enormous language models to reinforcement learning to combining all of those together into one um, sort of coherent model and you know, really, it's about bringing out those operator six senses. So, you know, we obviously have a lot of experience. And so it's really about finding um, out about how it's about modeling those operator decisions. Like, why did you look in that file share? Why did you, um, you know, why did you run a sequence in this particular a sequence of commands in this particular way? Uh, why did you, you know, do this? So it's, we we're trying to encode our um, our experience and our knowledge into these algorithms in some some coherent fashion and not only um, are we looking at for it to to support our operations um, you know a lot of other companies are, are doing the same and so you're going to have to have some kind of knowledge um, otherwise you know you'll be operating operating on a network and something's going to break, and you're going to you're not really going to be sure why, um, and it's, you're not going to be sure you're not going to be able to explain it, um, and you're not going to be able to have really any recourse in terms of troubleshooting. And as networks get tighter, those opportunities 
get are, are getting much um, we're losing access more often than than we were in the past and so unless we can explain why we can't go back and fix our tools and so we need to to have some sort of knowledge so we can go back um, and reintegrate or you know do some research and, and figure out what's going on but you know everybody's jumping on the bandwagon um, I remember, you know, or I'm sure a lot of you remember, application whitelisting, you know, three, two, three years ago at Black Hat, it was, um, everything was application whitelisting. Um, and then you had the LOL bins project. And, um, you know, as it turns out, there's actually a lot of stuff that can execute things. So vendors have kind of stopped talking about that. And now, now machine learning is kind of the way. Um, climate change, it's killing all fish. So this talk is really about fishing. Um, and over the course of maybe three years, we've seen a significant increase in the amount of effort required to fish. Um, and this is just a generic chart with numbers that I made up. But what it really shows is the number of interactions that we're having to do is going up. Um, the number of platforms that we're having to use, so whether it's hosting documents on S3, Azure, um, any other, you know, Dropbox, we're having to use a number of different platforms, um, the number of techniques we're having to use. So we used to be able to just send in, you know, simple macro and it would work, but now we're having, you know, a macro, an HTA, you know, an LNK file and an LNK file wrapped in an ISO, wrapped in a zip file. Um, so just the number of emails generally are going up and the number of um, interactions with targets and the number of techniques that you have to send to the targets. But 100% of emails are being inspected, whether it's, you know, a spam filter or um, you know whether it's third party or on site everything's being inspected we'd say probably 10 percent of our payloads are, are being sandboxed so it's still not a huge huge number um, 80 percent of our emails are received so you know the payloads do get delivered um, and we do get a 60 percent click rate uh, the issue is you know the endpoint protection that we're generally up against it's there's several of them so it's not any one product um, you know you're having to balance bypassing you know two or three different endpoint products so that means you know everything's our efforts going up but through ops there's kind of this this um, process where we have you know a comfort level you know ops are going smoothly everything's working fine work's getting done project manager's happy everyone's happy um, and then you know there's some sort of change and people start to implement new tech to, to new technology or, or whatever it might be. And there's some discomfort. Um, ops are taking longer to complete. The tools work, but you know, they have some challenges, uh, maybe some techniques that have um, fallen off in their usefulness or techniques are getting caught or, you know, we can't use one of our favorite techniques for whatever reason. And ultimately just leads to work taking longer. And um, so we need to do something. So now we're going to adjust um, and and this is works on hold as we you know rewrite our tools um, that we have to test you know we have to make sure everything works and then you know and we can start pushing things out but there's definitely a delay um, in work and I'd say in terms of the the phishing um, the phishing piece or the initial access piece we're definitely at that point of discomfort and an adjustment so my this talk obviously I think is a um, a representation of that and the research that I do um, is a representation of the adjustment that that we're having to make as a result of um, you know just some light discomfort in in regards to, to phishing um, but you know we've red teams have had it or attackers have had it easy for a very long time and so a lot of people will maybe complain that it's difficult I mean all of the teams we talk to um, so it's getting more difficult, you know, you're seeing a rise in sort of assume breach model testing. Um, but, you know, I think we're just in sort of a balancing phase where defenses are getting better and, and attackers are going to have to raise their game a little bit. Um, so we're going to go through a little um, exercise and sort of talk about how we do things. Uh, and so first thing when we're fishing, we start with a persona. So this, can, this is a fake person. Um, and they have work experience, you know, they went to a school, um, they're just a regular person and they represent um, kind of our team on the internet. And I would say probably each of our operators 
um, handles maybe four to six personas that they're responsible for. And you know, thanks to sort of machine learning, you know, these faces that you see on the left are all fake. They're they're not real people. Um, so if I'd <laughs> actually we used you know, you can just go on Google and, and, and Google for a person and you go to like the, the 15th page and you steal a profile picture. Um, you don't have to do that anymore. You can just generate a fake person. Um, so maybe, maybe deep fakes are actually good for the general population in this way. Um, but this is, you know, I think it's, this is not a person.com. Um, and so you can go, or this person does not exist.com. So you can go, you can generate a face um, and you can throw it up on LinkedIn. And, and fill out, you know, all the all the requisite information there. And then you have some sort of presence. You have an email address. You know, you can you can push out all the social media, um, build all the social media accounts you need, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but really, you know, when you're looking at uh, phishing, you want to get the right combination um, of things. So you need a persona. You obviously need a pretext, and you need some sort of target. So one of you know our, our favorite, um, our probably most successful fish come from our personas that are young women. Um, and the, my two favorite pretexts are, are just an executive recruiter or a new college graduate. Uh, and my targets are men aged 45 to 60, um, vice presidents, directors, uh, C-level, you know, those kind of people, um, or similar age women in similar positions. I tend to find that, um, if I'm fishing from a, a young women's persona, that older women are less um, interested in helping me out. Um, where, you know, men age this, and this is, you know, anecdotal, but men age 45 to 60 are generally um, extremely responsive. Um, they're more ambitious and they're generally more aggressive with following up uh, with, you know, with my emails. And so they, they make a very nice um, target as, you know, they're, they're more involved potentially in their careers, um, you know, or they're, you know, they're, they're always looking for the next, you know, best thing kind of. Um, although, you know, executives at, for example, Fortune One or, you know, top, or Fortune Five, let's say, are, you know, the recruiting process is a little different. And so you know, we, we I tend to just maybe stay away from um, executives at really, really big companies. Um, if I'm, you know, posing as a young man, uh, I like the, you know, job advice, like, hey, here's my resume, could you, you know, take a look at it? Or, you know, I'm thinking about, you know, you look like you took a similar career path to me, just wondering how it worked out for you, you know, would you be interested, you know, in looking at my resume or, you know, having a talk? Um, and the target can be really men aged, you know, any age, um, in any position. Effectively, you know, a lot of um, people are really, they're, they want to share their opinion and they want to, um, you know, they want to interact with you. So if you're asking someone about their opinion, you know, they're more likely to, to come back to you. Um, you know, and as, as the time goes on, you can say, oh, you, you know, do you want to get on the phone? You know, here's my calendar. The calendar is just a, an HTA that, you know, you send through you know, a link um, on S3 and you get execution that way. Um, again, so a young woman, pretext job advice or life advice, kind of the similar thing. And then, you know, older women in any position. So, you know, if you're asking for advice versus offering a position, um, I tend to find that, you know, older women are more inclined to help you out or um, take a look than if you are trying to, if you meet them in, in a business fashion. Um, but, you know, techniques to challenge the targets. So you want to be professional up front. You want to build a relationship. Um, you know, we, you want to make sure that you're following up with your targets. You know, don't just shoot off a phishing email and then come back uh, or not come back with anything. You want to make sure that you're following up. Um, if you found someone who's going to execute your fish, you know, send them multiple payloads. So use them to troubleshoot on the network. Um, and if you're recruiting, you know, salaries should be competitive. They shouldn't be egregious. You know, they shouldn't be ridiculously out. But, you know, in, in lieu, you can use stock options. So IPO, anything with tech, you know, fintech's very popular at the moment. So it's like, hey, you know, we're to start up IPO. You know, do you have your 
fishing accountant, you know, do you have IPO experience? And they're going to know exactly what that means um, for their paycheck. Um, but ultimately, you want to play to your strengths and you want to play to, you know, your targets, wants, needs, and expectations um, of your persona. So, you know, if, if, if you're fishing someone in, in Australia, for example, you want to make sure that you put the U's in, in the right places for the, the different spelling. Um, 10 targets. So executives, we like these, we like going after executives, but they're, they're high risk, um, high sometimes, and the, the reward's not always there um, because, you know, they don't always have access to the information we want. Interns, we love fishing interns, you know, they're new, they're fresh, they don't want to mess up, they, um, you know, they're looking for a new job that pays more. So these guys, these folks are always good. Marketing, you know, they're pretty hit or miss. Um, Sales are really good. They'll click on anything that says RFP or here's the invoice or so on and so forth. HR used to be our favorite, not so much anymore. They're just used to dealing with people. They have processes um, for shifting your document somewhere. And so, you know, they're kind of not a favorite of mine. Project managers, um, you know, they're also a favorite. They're used to receiving documents from the external IT folks, high risk and high risk, high reward. Um, I would recommend, you know, LinkedIn premium pays for itself. Um, you know, you can find, go and get, do a Google dork for some doc on their site, pull the email of that, poison the doc and send it back in. Um, but then when you start chatting with people, you know, this is the kind, oh, I pulled these messages out of our, our LinkedIn chats. Um, and some, some of them are kind of funny. Um, but I, I think you're beautiful is, you know, it's not an appropriate place for LinkedIn, but you know, you should use that to your advantage if you're trying to fish this person. Um, so, unstructured text is a really painful. So we have kind of two scenarios when we're, we're chatting with targets. We have, you know, are you interested? And he's like, no, I'm not interested. I'm happy where I am. Cool. Thank you. You know, move on to the next one. And then you have the other scenario where they are interested um, and you can start to converse with the target. Um, when you're conversing with the target, you know, you want to give yourself options. And so, hey, that link didn't work for me. Apologize, we're on a new system. You know, here's another one. Still couldn't open it. Here's an HDA. So, oftentimes, you know, if you find this this target that is willing to give you um, feedback, then you should definitely definitely um, push the envelope until you get caught. Um, but you know, we want to turn this into a you know machine learning problem. So, how can we do this? Well, you know, we can use word embeddings, um, and these word embeddings are just machine learnable representations. So. You know, given, given input Y, what's the probability of X? So given a conversation um, where this person is interested in a job and there's this conversation going on, what's the probability um, that, you know, the model should output this text versus the other text? Um, and, you know, it's really, it's, it's a joint probability problem. So when you're looking at training, so we gather your email logs, um, you want to recreate the conversations and sort of input output. Um, you'll want to, you know, turn all those creative vocabulary, turn all those words into numbers, and then you'll want to throw it into sort of a, a recurrent neural network, an LSTM, um, or you could even, you know, some of the larger GPT-2, which is a really large um, language model. Um, there's a, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of AI Dungeon, which I think came out of a student at BYU here in Utah. Um, you know, but it, it's looking at the probabilities of what the next word is in a given context. And so when you're running through this, you know, you can see, see what comes out. Um, and this is our email. So hi, this is, we gave it a context, hi Jim, I'm a graduate looking for a job. And the, the model just finished it for us, including the many thanks, including the name. Um, so you can see it's not great, but you know, you can, emails can be corrected and the emails are guaranteed to be different. So this is an, you know, another email. So this is useful in the, in the sense where, um, you know, a, a blue team is looking for similarity against our, uh, on our email. So let's say we, fi we fire off five templated emails. One of them gets caught. Um, these language models ensure that all of our emails are different. And so they're not as likely to get found. Um, but, you know, from a cost perspective, rewriting five fresh emails uh, before phishing is, can be, you know, it's costly, it's timely. Um, 
and we want to make, you know, we want to scale operations. So you know, if we can generate emails, even if they have to be corrected, then you know, that, that's awesome. Um, and you can just generate text almost infinitely. Um, and in my testing, generally about 30% of them are useful. 100% of them need some sort of tweaking. Um, and yeah, you can go kind of go from there. But you know, it, it, it's coherent, but it still sounds kind of odd. Um, and we can do the same with chat bots. So actually when I started, first started researching this, I was like, oh, um, look for a, a chat bot that does recruiting or, you know, where's some example code. And as it turns out, there's just legitimate companies that do this, um, which I'm surprised that I was surprised to find that. Um, but it's the same thing. So gather chat logs, you know, recreate the conversation, um, train, you know, your model, and then kind of see what comes out. Um, our generally, our issue generally is that we don't have, you know, a ton of these conversations. So a chat bot might, you know, a chatbot at a recruiting company might have you know, millions of examples. We probably have maybe, let's see, 2,500. So, you know, comparatively our models are going to be worse. Um, but this link in the bottom, you know, you can go to LinkedIn, you can pull out your, your messages. But so this is kind of an example of a conversation um, from, from, our, from our chatbot. But, um, and this, this, you know, hi, Sal, you're interested in a job. I am interested. What is it? Um, and then the response is, is, doesn't make sense in the context. Um, and so these are kind of difficult to, to get away with, but I would say, you know, it's mostly the issue that we have is we hindered by the amount of data we have. So, you know, we just can't keep data for the sake of machine learning. Our clients, you know, it's unpopular, um, for us to keep data, even though, you know, clients will ship. Um, you know, they'll ship all their logs off to carbon black in the cloud, you know, but it, we're not allowed to. It's obviously a different kind of information, but I'm wondering if that will change in the future. Um, things like adversary simulation products, for example, if they, they're going to start to implement AI some, at some point and they're going to have to keep data. Um, you know, temp, I would say generally templates are easier to write. They're easier to send, you know, you're in control of everything and they're still not getting caught, but they will get you caught, you know, if, if some blue teams finds one email, they will likely find the rest of them. Um, but chatbots and, and AI and language models um, are just going to get better from here. So, you know, we're kind of at the beginning of it, which is um, exciting, but also scary. There's, you know, there's, there's a ton of work to be done in, in organizations everywhere. Um, and there are just new risks presented. So, you know, the whole adversarial piece um, is another one. Um, find me after, I'm, I'll be on the B-Side Slack um, and Twitter, and then I'll put these slides up on, on, the, um, on, this, on this GitHub link here. Sorry, I kind of talk kind of fast. Okay, so we have um, a couple minutes or two minutes for questions. Are there any questions? Can people hear me? Yeah, we can, we can hear you. I don't see any questions in the Q&A or in the chat. If anybody has anything, but it, we just got one. Um, they said, I have no experience in ML. Where should I start? Um, I would start with, so binary classification, um, definitely start there. There's a great book called Make Your Own Neural Network by Tariq Rashid um, and it, breaks down um, a neural network, just the simplest components, and it is dead simple to understand. Uh, do, I, do you have any AI tool or research references? Um, yeah, I would say so I, there's a DEF CON um, AI Slack, um, and if you're interested, I would definitely recommend joining um, that Slack in addition, um, you know, to sort of you know, Googling, I think there's a, there's a lot of um, research that's done in labs that isn't very practical for our use cases. So there's 
there's going to be a lot of effort that's going to have to go through and pick out this academic research and apply it to us, to the offensive use case. Um, another question. So if attacks are moving this way from a blue team perspective, how do we go about combating this? Um, I think a lot of the tools don't really exist yet in, or they, they're starting to be built in, but the, the maturity isn't there. So, you know, even though, you know, we're, we're doing this research um, on networks, we're generally not having issues with machine learning products that we know of yet. I'd say Proofpoint is an exception to that, but you know, they're, they're, they're pretty good at what they do. Um, and so, yeah, I would, I would, I would just say, hang on. It's going to be, you know, two, a year, two, three before um, these products are really going to be useful for you. Um, in the meantime, though, if you're if you have your own data, then you can go through and um, you know build your own own models. So you're looking for cosine similarity, um, similarity scores for for malicious events, um, things like that. Um, then, so we're out of time, but there is one project that I want to highlight for the defensive side. It's a project called Cybert, C-Y-B-E-R-T, um, and it was put out by, um, not sure it was put out by, but they're looking at, at this kind of stuff. So there's definitely a, a gold mine there for the defensive side. Excellent. So that's it for me. If you guys have questions, um, I'll be in the B-side Slack, uh, and if you just want to talk machine learning, I'll be there as well. Thank you, guys.